One great way that EGCA brings member value is by putting together member panels to discuss topics of interest for the majority. Our panel discussion today is to provide insight on diesel fuel maintenance, and Kurt Summers will be the moderator. Uh, before I turn over to Kurt, I'd like to introduce each of the panel members. Uh, Brian Bosey, President and CEO of B3, B3C Solutions. And interesting here, Brian is uh, a first-timer, so I think it's interesting that he hits the floor running with uh, service to the organization. Luke Jaynes, Key Accounts Manager from United, United Alloy. Brian Venhorst, National Accounts Manager from Tremont Manufacturing. And also Dan Bigelow from CPAR Filters. And one comment, I didn't realize it was a prerequisite for the board members all have a beard. That just kind of came together naturally. Uh, but I'd also like to, uh, we have some young EGSA members up here, which again, I think it's awesome that they're serving the organization. So I'll turn over the podium to Kurt Summers from Austin Generators. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. We've got an exciting uh, discussion today on diesel fuel maintenance, but I, I've got to start with uh, Charlie's final comment. You know, uh, I shaved this morning. I guess I shouldn't have. So let me, let me get ready for the uh, panel. Apparently, and I got a little soul patch here. <laughs> How's this look, guys? Look good. Yeah. What do you think? Not too distracting. <laughs> Looks original, right? Uh -huh. Well groomed. We could actually talk about facial hair grooming instead of yeah. diesel fuel maintenance, and this could go on for a while. Or lack of it. Right. <laughs> what we're going to talk about today is is a subject that I think gets neglected in our industry a lot. And so we've assembled a panel of experts to not only talk about diesel fuel treatment, cleaning, testing, but also we've integrated fuel tanks into this because there's an aspect of fuel tanks that plays into this. I want you to raise your hand if you or others in your company are actively involved in providing generator preventive maintenance. So let's first of all talk about who does PMs on generators, all right? So now if those of you have raised your hand, uh, how many of you provide or actively recommend some level of diesel fuel maintenance for those same customers? Okay, so it is, yeah. it is on our radar, right? We do think about it. Maybe sometimes we don't do it with the best techniques or the best results, and that's part of what this panel is gonna bring, some new ideas. We want you to walk away with some uh, thoughts and considerations. We're not gonna exhaustively cover this topic, so after this uh, panel discussion, uh, all the panels are available to, uh, to talk to you and uh, share additional perspective. So our, our first uh, question goes to uh, Brian from B3C. Uh, Brian, we've all heard the adage, knowledge is power. Knowing is always better than guessing. And when it comes to diesel fuel inside genset fuel tanks, there's a lot going on we simply cannot see. How can we really know the condition of the fuel? Oh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, fuel hygiene, I've been preaching it for five years now. Um, Fuel is uh, changing, and uh, you know, basically ask the question, when was the last time you tested the fuel in the tank? What's in your tank? Um, you know, a lot of people really don't really dig into what's at the bottom of that machine, but the life of the piece of the equipment starts with the fuel. So fuel hygiene is about understanding the condition of the fuel in the tank. It's about being the expert in your field and differentiating your company versus all, all the others. If you're a fuel expert, you can go in and tell them exactly what's going on to, to eliminate possible problems going forward. Um, it's about CYA. I mean, literally, if, if you're doing a PM on that machine, um, if the machine works, you're a hero. If it doesn't in that time of need, you know, they're going right back to you. The other thing is, on a new piece of equipment, the, um, the first tank of fuel might be its only tank of fuel. So you gotta make sure you set that fuel up correctly because, you know, honestly, if, if you might not use a diesel generator for 10 years. It depends on where you're at. Um, and it can be a profit center. Fuel hygiene is, uh, you know, a possible profit center. So what's in your tank? So basically, diesel fuel has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. The EPA has been reducing the amount of sulfur um, slowly over time uh, from 500 parts per million down to 15 parts per million. Uh, 
creating what is known as ultra low sulfur diesel. Uh, so it started in mid 2006 and approximately 2010 off-road diesel was included. Um, the process of removing the sulfur uses a, a, a process that is called hydro desulfurization and it actually creates a diesel that has more bound water and it has less affinity to hold the water. So, so if you understand anything, all diesel has water in it, 200 parts per million, approximately, ASTM. So we can slide. Oh, we, what happened to the, where does the water come from? But anyways, we had a case study. <laughs> um, I went on to a major uh, corporate server farm and um, this is where the world's information goes through. This is one of the largest in the world. They have 37 generators. Uh, Department of Education, Department of Defense, GM, Pfizer. I mean, your information is going through there and stored here. 37 generators. One would think their fuel would be very, very pure and pristine. <laughs> oh, this is us. Okay, so. <laughs> Kind of All right, so this is a sink. So the, the, the water uh, comes from, sorry, this is kind of backwards now. Uh, it, comes, it comes from, it's in, the, it's in the fuel. It comes from condensation um, in the fuel uh, through heating and cooling of the, of, of the, uh, the day. And um, it could even come from external leaks. So over time, the water accumulates in the fuel and it creates um, it, it, the specific gravity is heavier than, than the diesel and ends up on the bottom of the tank, um, creating a water diesel interface. On that water diesel interface is where microbial activity can colonize. So now we're on track. Okay. Um, when uh, the water diesel interface is where they colonize. So in a diesel tank, you have a perfect environment for uh, Actually, I call it a terrarium in the tank. It's a, a, a literal petri dish. When you have water and you have hydrocarbon, you have water and a source of food. The hydrocarbons in the diesel, the uh, microbial activity uh, colonize on the water and creating a rag layer. And in the uh, uh, on that co uh, colonization, you have yeast, bacteria, and mold, and um, they 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 thrive in this environment. Uh, once the diesel bugs begin to grow, they double every 20 minutes. So, so some, suddenly you have this terrarium and it's actually festering in there. Um, as they grow, they create um, byproducts and some of them are weak acids, some of them are sludge, asphaltines, um, and other harmful byproducts. It's the weak acids that are concerning pretty much uh, the most because First of all, the weak acids are, are creating uh, rust and corrosion um, in the bottom of the tank, but they have a vapor pressure higher than the diesel. So what it is, they're, they're migrating through the diesel and it's contaminating the top of the tank. And so it, it contaminates the whole head space. So what we're seeing is it's contaminating the diesel, but it's also contaminating the head space and rusting it. And we're seeing cases where through the condensation and heating and cooling of the day, the water accumulates on the top and then the rust rolls down the side and ends up on the bottom of the tank where your pickup tube is. So most generators, after you do your PM, you run it for 30 to 40 minutes, most generators fail in about two hours into it because what it is is just churning up all the garbage on the bottom, the biofilms and the sludge, and it just plugs the filters. So knowing that, you gotta control the water. Um, so back to the case study for the server farm. So we went on the server farm and it was an impressive, impressive uh, situation. I got an inside look at, at, at this place. And what we found was every tank was contaminated. Every tank on this, 37 generators, every tank was contaminated. Um, if you look down, I mean, they, they, they are pretty good with their major, but they have lifeline generators, and truly, they've been there since the 60s and 70s, and the amount of rust and corrosion was absolutely astounding. If you look down at that middle picture, if you look down the neck, 
it was complete solid rust. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? It's a way above the fuel line. That's that, that vaporization of the weak acids corroding that, that upper. But another thing I like to do when you can get to the bottom of the tank is to swab the bottom of the tank because biofilms adhere themselves. And if you have a bottom sample test, sometimes those films won't get into that, that sample test. Um, they call it a bacon bomb or fuel thief or whatever you want to call it. So I like to swab the bottom of the tank because I had a, a situation um, for a major uh, shipping company and I was getting no, no water but they had biofilms and they were breaking off and it was turning the generators off someplace in the middle of the country. Um, all the fuel was, had a layer of water, uh, microbial, everything that you can imagine w were in these tanks. So um, the, fuel, the filters were plugged, so we can go to the next one. So what can you do? Understand what's in that tank. Uh, look at the openings of the tank. If you see rust, you already, there's an indicator that this tank is contaminated right there. Swab the tanks, check the filters, acquire a bottom sample, uh, test for acid number. As fuel ages, the acid number increases. Um, pr preserve your fuel when you, before you, you, know, bef before you uh, do a new insta installation. Make sure you preserve the fuel. It's important. Now, diesel is not like it used to be. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could put diesel in a field and leave it there for 10 years. And it'd still be diesel fuel and it'd be usable. Nowadays, diesel fuel is going bad quickly. They're adding biodiesel, which is made from another food source. That goes bad. And so understand what's going on. Re test the fuel, preserve the fuel, keep the water at bay, record the data. Make sure you record it. This is a great opportunity to CYA, listen, we were here, we checked the fuel, it all passed, it all looked good. Something happens, you, you guys look good and you look professional. And in a lot of cases, and the server farm, most of those tanks needed to be polished. So really, if it's really bad down there, you need to start clean, get it clean. So you need to polish the fuel. And um, you know, so that's, you know, so basically understanding and then having the right course of action from there. So with the polishing, I, I leave that to Dan. So let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about polishing and then uh, uh, Dan, why don't you also talk about the uh, sources of contamination? All right, thank you. Uh, Brian, thank you. Uh, just hitting on a lot of points that, uh, that Brian, and I'm gonna repeat some of them there because uh, knowing what's in your tank and knowing the state is the only way that you're gonna be able to tell your customer that, hey, this is where you are and this is how I took you to the next place. Um, so really going in and testing and understanding, uh, you know, ISO 4406 is uh, testing how many particles are in the fuel. I'm not going to go through and explain all of these. This is stuff you guys can look up on your own time. The main thing is just know what your number is and know what you need to do to change that number. Uh, so looking at, you know, normal fuel quality, typical levels of fuel when you get it delivered are already at an unacceptable level. So <clears throat> there are levels for where they're expecting the tank filtration to be at, where the inline or onboard filtration to be at, and what should be going into the injectors. So the important thing is really do that testing, record your data, so that you know where you are so you can get to where you need to be and, and show your customers where you've got them to be so that you're maintaining that green level or that ISO 12, I believe it is. So what are some ways to, to get to those levels? Uh, there's the use of additives, uh, the inline, improving your inline filtration between the tank and the generator, uh, and then getting into fuel polishing systems. Uh, all three ways have their benefits, but until you know what's going on there, you don't know which one is the right application. It may be that the use of a, a regular fuel additive will solve the issue for your customer and leaving the rest of their filtration, what they're doing is fine. You may need to increase the inline filtration. Uh, like having a multiple stage fuel water separator pr uh, primarily that has a large capacity for water removal and water capacity. 
because that is uh, the big issue. Uh, all of those things that uh, Brian was stemming off there, the root cause of all of those is water. And that's an ongoing issue that as temperature fluctuates, water is going to get back in there. So you have to continually get it out. So some of, the, some of the different ways that you can do that is you know, using a, a portable unit that you go on site uh, while you're doing other PM work is have this unit run, pull the fuel out, run it through a filtration, and return the fuel back to the tank. It helps stir up some of those things. And as Brian was mentioning, uh, those things get stirred up and usually generators fail after first two hours. Well, when you go there and stir, th it, uh, purposely stir these things up so that they can get caught in the filter. So you're plugging up the filter on your polishing unit rather than your inline filter to your generator. So the next kind of step up from that is having a permanently installed unit. And you know this is another area where um, if the customer has a large volume of fuel, 10,000 gallon tank, or has a critical application like server farms, hospitals, etc., having a, a dedicated machine and then offering the service to make sure that that machine is providing the, the ISO quality fuel uh, to your customer. So this could be another avenue uh, uh, for you guys of while you're out there, it's like, I'm gonna check, document the polisher. This is the last time the filter was changed. This is how much water we got out. This is a fuel sample. There's a lot of different things, but the main thing is with these systems is moving that failure point uh, away from the generator, away from the primary filters, and to a place where it's non-critical. It, it doesn't matter if the, fuel, the filter on the fuel polisher clogs. You want it to clog there so that it's saving you down the line. And then the next thing is going into, you know, there's a lot of different options as far as polishers. There's very simple ones, there's very complex ones. This is a, a picture of a unit that we did for a, a hospital uh, where they wanted, you know, double redundancy. It automatically services three different tanks. Uh, they wanted to have backup pumps in case one pump failed and backup filters. So it alternates and it runs automatically. It's got a beautiful touch screen, you know, that the uh, service manager can dial in with his smartphone and, and monitor moving tanks. You know, do you need that for every installation? No, you don't. But you do need to do something. And it starts with finding out where you are to figure out what is the right a uh, uh, piece of equipment for your application. Is it coming out and doing something portable, or is it going with you know, a Lexus of fuel polishers uh, to, to get, grab all of that data? So just as uh, uh, Brian was showing there, the, 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 the water level and, and the sludge all fall down to the bottom. And this is where, you know, uh, with different tanks and what you have to take in mind for is it's going to happen. You're going to have water in there. That water is going to have life in it, and it's going to feed off the fuel. So what are some ways in looking at the tank and having the polishers, knowing that these things are going to happen, how are you going to prepare to go against them? Uh, we have where all of those things, grabbing the pickup tubes at the bottom, well, what about the pickup tubes for your polisher? And what about uh, your pickup tubes versus your inline to your uh, supply? You know, are you grabbing those things and making sure you pick up for the polishing unit, you're grabbing all those things off the bottom and maybe have the pickup for your supply a little higher. So uh, those are all different things you can look at with the tank, because uh, the tank is the container. Uh, it's what holds, you know, the, the lifeblood, uh, the fuel of the engine, and there's a lot of things there to be considerations on the tank side itself. So you have every time, like you were saying, when you refuel, when you're polishing, you have a snow globe. You're taking all of those things at the bottom and shaking them up, and it's getting stirred up, and it takes some time before it's going to get to the engine. So the main thing is, let's get it to a polisher, let's get it to where you're filtering it out, and it's not getting in line. Because we have to deal with these you know, biodiesels and everything else that, like Brian mentioned there, that is just gonna exacerbate this issue. Where you have uh, the tier four coming on, where the need for clean, dry fuel is becoming increasingly important. All right, excellent. So Luke, uh, your expertise is in uh, fuel tanks. We've heard from two experts on the fuel treatment, testing, uh, cleaning, kind of what our, what our problem is. Let's hear a little bit from you, Luke, on kind of the tank's perspective and how these contaminants affect the uh, physical tank itself. All right, well, working here, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not an expert on fuel contamination, but um, 
in Charlie's words, I'm an expert at rectangular boxes that don't leak. So I'm going to talk about uh, most standby fuel tanks you, you see in the field are UL double wall tanks. Um, as you can see in this slide, there's a primary tank that holds the diesel and a secondary containment basin that holds fuel in the event that the uh, primary tank leaks. The primary tank is permanently vented to the atmosphere through a normal vent, and both the primary and containment basin are vented with emergency vents should the tank become pressurized. The tank also is equipped with a low-level switch and rupture basin leak switch, um, and these are the basic um, things that you'll see in a fuel tank. So um, generally, from a contamination standpoint, you're going to the interstitial space is raw steel, and so is the inner, the inner tank. So if you don't have fuel in that tank for months on end, you're going to just get um, moisture in the air that's going to cause premature rust in the tank. So it's important to either oil fog the tank or um, have it filled with diesel or use some of the polishing techniques that they just talked about. Next slide. So as far as UL tanks, there's... There's UL-142, ULCS-601, and UL-2085. It's important to know which certification is required in your area so you don't have unnecessary costs um, incurred by having a generator show up on a job site and the AHJ reject it because it's the wrong UL-listed tank. Um, it's important to specify US or Canada as some tanks are labeled for one or the other. And the interstitial space on a UL-2085 tank is filled with concrete to be fire resistant and impact resistant. UL-2085 is not commonly required, but is gaining popularity in higher risk applications. Mobile tanks are a little trickier as far as design. Um, it's, it's a little odd to me, you know, I've been in the industry for eight years, but there's, in the US, there isn't a, typical certification for mobile generators. Um, the fuel tanks, you'll see plastic fuel tanks, you'll see single wall steel tanks. Um, but in Canada, they've uh, enforced UN31A for uh, tanks 450 liters and above are required to be UN31A certified. Um, this is an area where I think, uh, you know, after I heard the speech yesterday from UL that I want to get engaged with UL and talk about standards for mobile uh, generator tanks, because we don't have those today, and we, we probably should, considering these are going to be uh, driven down the highway. So, next slide. Well, so now, now that you know the basic uh, tank certifications, um, each tank is factory pressure tested um, at 3 to 5 PSI with a soap and water solution. Um, both the primary tank and the uh, secondary containment basin are both tested uh, using the soap and water solution. Um, as you can see in this uh, slide here, it's important to consult the factory before doing any of your own uh, pressure testing because your tank can turn into a balloon. Um, this tank right here uh, started, it starts to deform at between five and 10 PSI. And in this picture, I mean, the bottom of that tank is raised up a good six inches. Um, UL, from a safety factor standpoint, you, the um, factory testing is 3 to 5 PSI, but to get certified, you have to go up to 15 PSI, so there is a safety factor there. But we have had calls in the field uh, for false leaks because um, the tanks aren't being tested correctly or somebody's blown up a tank or ruptured a baffle. Um, so it's important to consult the factory uh, before doing any of your own pressure testing in the field. And then, as most of you know, um, UL tanks don't meet a lot of regional codes. This has always been interesting to me. Um, these are rectangular boxes, but it seems like every city and state has their own uh, standard for fuel tanks. Um, it makes it a challenge um, for us uh, tank manufacturers that are trying to work with OEMs and supply product to distributors that they can use. Um, so these are the basic accessories that we run into, and it seems like a lot of states are starting to follow the international fire code. Um, so that's another project that I think that we could work with UL and some of the other organizations out there to more standardize the fuel tank market, uh, just make it 
easier on everybody. Not every city and state needs its own regional code. All right. And then uh, as far as tanks and their accessories, they are designed to be leak tight to prevent contamination um, into the fuel tank. But standing water on a tank can cause issues by creeping into the tank, so it's important to make sure um, you're getting good water runoff on the tank. Um, we have a few designs that we've been working on to actually slant the tank cover for, to get some of that water that collects on the top to run off the tank. Um, and then it's also important to make sure that your tank is either oil fogged or contained with diesel because even a week or two in the humidity with the, the tank being normally vented can have rust and cause issues uh, with contamination. So that's a good segue. I want to kind of make a point of what Luke just talked about. We've been talking about fuel contamination. Now we're talking about tanks. You're thinking, okay, that's two different topics. That last point he made is what uh, uh, Dan's going to, uh, or excuse me, Brian's going to point out, uh, is that contamination uh, coming through your enclosure into your tank. So, uh, Brian, talk a little bit about tank design and contamination and share with us some of your, uh, your thoughts on that. Sure. Thank you. Um, Real quick, I'd like to echo Luke's uh, comment he made earlier with the overpressurization of the tanks we've seen out in the field where they're not following our recommendations as a manufacturer, which uh, Luke had the picture earlier where the tank was turned into a balloon, um, the football effect, if you will. And uh, we've actually seen two megs get lifted straight off the ground by these tanks. Mm. So uh, it will happen. And when they let it out, it goes back down. But now you've deformed your metal. Um, and you've probably cracked a baffle and or a weld in there somehow. So uh, please or follow the manufacturing standards and uh, please follow those. And I cannot say that again, please follow those. So that being said, um, so um, you want to ask the question or you want me to go ahead and ask? Go ahead. All right. So uh, this is just something I came up with myself and it is something I see more and prevalent every day. Uh, just a quick show of hands if I could by the crowd. How many of you have customers that regularly wash and maintain their tanks and enclosures? <laughs> All right, how many of these units okay. cost hundreds of thousands of dollars? <laughs> exactly. All right, now how many of you at the same time would buy a brand new car, put it in your driveway, never move it, you're gonna go out and you're gonna start it up once a week, you're going to change oil once every six months or a year, and you're going to come out 10 years later, and you're going to look at it, and you go, man, that's my new car. Probably not. So what are we going to do about this? You got that first slide up. So as you can see here, this is what can happen. Um, the first picture is one I pulled off the internet. I admit I did not see that one in person, but I have seen some in person that look very similar to that. And if any of you have ever been techs or are owners in the field, I'm sure you all know of this unit that's out there. Uh, everyone knows of that one dilapidated one that's in the field. That second picture to your right there, that's an actual tank that we got asked to replace. Uh, as a custom manufacturer of tanks from time to time, it's requested that we replace enclosures in the field and tanks. This one happened to have been compromised and rusted through all the way at the top. So there was water getting through, rust, debris, a number of... Where is that stuff in the right slide? Where is that? That's rust. That's rust. It's actually flaking up off of the tank. That's, that's all rust in that. That is the tank. Yes, that's the top of the tank. We did not manufacture this tank. That was a scuttle hole. If you notice on the top that was bolted on, we're not quite sure what the purpose of that was. But you can see where there was a little bit of a gasketing, if you will, that they pulled up from that. They're having a lot of water intrusion, so that's, uh, that's what you're seeing here. If you go to the next slide, please. And with just a little bit of maintenance, you can make a big difference. And very rarely do we, you know, when I go out to a, a site and I look at a tank or an enclosure that needs to be replaced and they're asking someone to go out and visit and see what it's all about, because usually it's something that's been out there for a number of years, nine times out of 10, it looks like this on the inside. Very rarely are they clean and pristine when we're called in anyway to replace something. Now, this, these are pictures that are actually from a tech that I know, and he has a lot of pride in his work, and he took it upon himself on his own time to clean this enclosure after they got the maintenance contract back for it. So it was someone else's baby. It came to him. He was done with work for the day, but he stuck around, and he actually cleaned the whole thing, did a before and after. It's just going above and beyond. 
but I think this is something that we could start doing as maybe a maintenance fact or something that the dealers or distributors could possibly be offering to their customers in the future. Go to the next slide, please. So what's our biggest enemy? It's rust. And, how do, and what does rust need to grow? It needs three things. It needs oxygen, water, and bare metal. So we can't take the oxygen out of the air. And as uh, CCR once asked, who will stop the rain? No one. <laughs> so the only variable that we really can't control is the bare metal. And there's a couple of different contributing factors to that bare metal, uh, one of which would be human interaction. Someone on site knocking into it with a tool belt or a toolbox or a part or animals in the area, whatever it may be. And the other one might be environment and geographic location, such as marine, salt air. Salt spray can travel many miles inland and affect rust. Uh, anything within 20 miles of a coast, we usually recommend that the enclosure is made out of aluminum or stainless steel, just for this fact. Railroads and rail dust, this is something not a lot of people think about, but rail dust is a big contributing factor to rust, especially in cars. But if you have units that are near a metro or near a normal railway, rail dust can actually fly up from the rails, melt themselves into the paint, and start rusting almost immediately. Industrial locations. Depending on the facility, if it has a high alkaline or, alkaline or acidic atmosphere, uh, interstates, roads, parking lots with road salt sprays from plows and cars, weather, hail, ice storms, extreme temperature changes, and prevailing winds like sand and dirt abrasion. Units are constantly being bombarded by these factors, which can eventually degrade the unit and compromise its effectiveness. So this is a NFPA 110-27 EPSS maintenance schedule. You can find this in uh, NFPA 110. And this has just some recommended standards for doing maintenance for your techs out in the field. But there are some that aren't on there that I would like to recommend as a tank manufacturer that we see from time to time when customers call in with problems. And uh, first and foremost, remove, inspect, and clean the fuel gauges. Sediment, algae, and other microorganisms can work their way into fuel gauges, causing them to fault. And also, fuel gauges can actually get stuck in those microorganism areas that Brian and Dan were speaking about earlier, causing them to fail. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that before in a tank. Fortunately, uh, yeah. Uh, in our own tank, very akin to uh, the shoemaker that walks around with holes in his shoes, I'll share you guys a story of uh, a lot of things Brian's talking about on uh, inspecting your enclosure. Uh, we did not think to look at the roof of the enclosure. Uh, we are right next to a railway in South Florida, uh, about a, three miles away from the beach. Uh, so we do have a lot of that marine salt air. Uh, we developed uh, uh, rust on the top of the enclosure that then leaked water directly onto the tank, uh, which you know I might have to see one of those slanted tank designs. Uh, that would have been nice, because then we got water in the tank, we gummed up our fuel gauges, uh, you know, destroyed the inside of the tank, and uh, had to replace everything. And that's coming from the fuel polishing and filter guy. <laughs> <laughs> so other things that I would recommend is inspect the strainers and solenoid valves. Visually inspect the secondary containment area for fuel. Fuel gauges can fail. And if there is fuel in the secondary containment area, that's a pretty easy way to do it. It's just pulling the emergency vent and looking in there. It takes just a couple minutes. Inspect the top of the tank for fluids. Wash down the tank from time to time. And touch up the paint on any bare metal surfaces. And for enclosures, uh, can we go to the next one, please? Thank you. Inspect inlet and outlet hoods and remove any debris. Inspect the motorized louvers and dampeners. And make sure they're working properly. Wash the enclosure. I've spoken with various different paint manufacturers, and some of them are kind of across the board, but they suggest that in a tough environment, washing it every six months would help greatly. And in a normal environment, 12 to 24 months. So after you wash the enclosure, you can inspect the inside for any kind of leaks. If you find any leaks, reapply caulk to any questionable areas. You want to check the door gasketing and make sure that any gaskets that are part of the unit are intact. And then, of course, touch up the paint on any bare metal surfaces. 
Now you hear me talk about cleaning stuff. That's all well and good, right? Duh. Clean things. Great, Brian. You're brilliant. Great idea. Well, what can this mean for you? Well, it's just an idea, but this could be an upsell for current service contracts out there for dealers and distributors. It could also be your foot in the door. Being no one's really doing this is the show of hands earlier. It could be your way in. This, in turn, could also be a potential revenue builder for your branch. I spoke to many different branches, and on average, the distributors say they do about 2,000 generators a year. So let's say you get just a quarter of your customers to do this, and you're able to provide this service. And you don't have to pay a tech to do it. You can just get a general laborer, one of your old trucks around, throw a pressure washer in there, and you know it's, it's not that complicated. But they could maybe do one or two units a day, and oh, well, that's all depending on size and location. Is also size and location is how much you're going to charge them. But let's just say on a low end, you get three hundred dollars per unit, and you're going to get a quarter of your customers to do that. That's five hundred units. That's an extra hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in revenue that's just sitting there that could possibly be taken. What else does that do for you? It extends the life of your product in the field, which leads to fewer customer complaints saves your customers money in the long run, and helps to ensure future business with those customers. Because the next time they buy a piece of equipment, they're gonna want that to buy that great, same, long-lasting product from you. Thanks. Great, thanks guys. So we have a couple of perspectives here, right? We're talking about inside the tank, we're also talk talking about the exterior of the tank, some really good takeaways. Uh, we've got a few minutes, I believe, Charlie, for some questions, okay. I know we've got a couple of questions in the audience. Uh, you mentioned the use of additives, and some of these gen sets are uh, using emission control equipment that has catalysts for, could be poisoned by additives. Could you uh, address that in any way? Do you know what you're putting in there relative to catalyst poisoning? And uh, also the second question I had was, uh, in regards to failures, we talked about yesterday uh, fuel, battery, and coolant. Uh, what, what about just attributed to the fact of maintenance. And have you seen anything in the field that indicates improper maintenance would result in a failure? Uh, yeah, why don't you go? Uh, the additive, okay. The good question on the additives. The, the tier four, tier three um, common rail, uh, the additives are truly EPA registered. And that doesn't mean a lot, but it means there's nothing in the additive that will harm the emission control system. So there's no metals, there's no, no harmful components. So truly, it, it can cause no harm. Um, that's why you, you, you register your, your additive. So the EPA is gonna look at your, your components and they're gonna deem it if it can be EPA registered. So just make sure the additive is EPA registered and it fits the specs that you're looking for and you're gonna be fine. Another question. Just to, to add on that point and to get to the part of uh, improper maintenance, you know, the, the testing and just know what you're putting in there. Have a good understanding of what, where you're starting and what you want to go to so that you might not have, you, you know, can avoid that complication where you may have uh, an additive that's working in conjunction or ad adversely. Uh, but to your question of improper maintenance causing failures, I will throw myself on the sword again and say improper maintenance of the enclosure, you know, led to water contamination in our own tank on our generator and cost a lot of money. I would put that to improper maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Uh, this question, I guess, I think it'd be for Brian and or Dan. I, I was talking to Dan earlier about um, the issues of, of not maintaining fuel. They, um, you know, it's kind of out there. You, you don't see it until you have a problem. So. I think your challenge is to get people to be more proactive. But I'm wondering, uh, have either of you or anybody in the industry, uh, industry produced a white paper on this, um, something that we could use to proactively get this out in a non-marketing way, just a factual way to raise awareness? And, and if so, great, I'd like to have it. And if not, I'd like to ask you to consider that. Well, a couple, couple years back, we actually did do an article for Powerline. Uh, the polishing comes with a price tag. Uh, but I think given uh, the uh, change in different additives, different uh, 
you know, engine manufacturers are coming to filter manufacturers and asking us to increase things. So there's been a lot of changes, and it's probably due for uh, for an update. Mine needs to be updated also, but I also we um, published a small book called New Fuels, New Rules, which needs to be updated at this point because things are changing, um, which we can convert that into a white paper and take the marketing portion out of the back. So yeah, we can get that done pretty fast. Okay. Uh, regarding the white paper, Cummins put out a white paper a few years ago on this subject that we're talking about. Um, I can forward that to you if you like, um, but that's, that's what they talk about. Well, I got way more than one question. <laughs> this Bring is, it on. <laughs> this is a huge topic, and it's got a lot of dimension to it. Uh, you know, in the olden days, you had underground tanks that had a common temperature to them, right? They didn't breathe. So I can only imagine we live in a dry uh, climate, but I can imagine back east or in a high humidity where tanks are replacing the air. I'd love to know that number with all the humidity. And so you, their design is to, how can you keep the moisture out when they're breathing? Is there a device, it's one question, that, like a desiccant to keep that moisture from migrating into a tank? Number two, now that the design of most gensets or all gensets are this huge base tank that's flat, both top and bottom, even with a polisher, you aren't moving that fuel across the base of that tank to some outlet. So you got all this real estate down there that is uh, potentially contaminated, and you can't clean it because you got so much baffling from one end of that tank to the other. Trying to move that and put it in suspension it, to, to cycle it through a filter is, is a job in itself, like on a two meg. And then the tops of the tanks, no matter what you do, you're gonna have water. And the design needs to be more concave to where water cannot collect on top of a tank. So there's so much in this topic that should be built into UL or designs or the tank manufacturers to just keep that moisture out of the tank. And once you do have it in the tank, how do you get it out when the design is all flat? Good point. Luke, Brian? Uh, touch on it and then Luke can jump on on the design side of things. Um, Dan had made a really good point on tank design earlier this week. Um, not really going to say exactly what it is at this time because we have to look into it a little bit more, but it will hopefully help with that bottom area and the transfer from the fuel from one side to the other to allow that to happen a little bit easier. Um, as for the convex or the concaved top part, um, that'd be kind of tough just for that aspect that we need to have constant venting across equal across the top of the tank along with atmospherically controlled. That's um, with the breathing in and out of the tank. Um, I mean, it is something we can definitely look into. Um, I'd be excited to look into it. It's just, um, you know, there's some physics that go into it that we always have to make sure that we're covering to, for the safety aspect of the tank. This, is, this has actually been a topic that w working with OEMs that has been brought up. Um, so there are specific designs that we've come up with, adding weep holes and stuff to the sides of the tank, slanting the cover even just slightly just to get some water runoff. Um, I agree with you. I've seen it in the field, water on top of tanks, and then it ends up creeping, rusting fittings and, and, and whatnot. So there, I think there are some things that can be done um, in the industry. The UL standards um, are pretty old, so that maybe there's an approach we could uh, meet with them and come up with some new standards and requirements. Great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you guys being here. Charlie one said one question. more. Charlie, your, your call. One quick question. Can you test for biodiesel if you find it? What do you do? What do you recommend? Yeah, we can test for biodiesel. We have a, uh, I have a little instant test. Um, truly, if you can buy biodiesel free, even though I love biodiesel, we, we don't want it in the diesel generator. Um, or you can send it off to a lab and they can give you an exact number. Uh, truly, if you, if you know your source of, of your diesel, try to find as pure diesel as you can. Um, if not, we can do a quick test or we can send it off to a lab. Uh, but it's important to know your biodiesel because that's going to really shorten the lifespan of that diesel. It's just like buying ethanol-free gasoline for, for you know, different components that are going to be stored. Try to 
eliminate any of the bio aspect of it. Just to add on that with biodiesels and generators, uh, we had a situation uh, during Hurricane Sandy with a, a food kitchen uh, that had filters plugging up because of biodiesels and generators. We went back and forth and uh, were helping them. But the, the end all they found out is, specifically in generators, if you have biodiesel, burn it. Burn it all and fill up with new diesel. And with that, I believe we're done. Thank you folks so much. Thank you.